Hey y'all, very exciting day. Today we're gonna to show you how to plant trees the permaculture way and it's easy. Hey y'all, wonderful day. Look, here it is, like we're barely in the March. We're out here in t-shirts, have been for days. So this is wonderful. So here I am, Billy, along with my homestead honey, Michelle, which she loves that title so much, y'all. So feel free to call her that anytime. <laughs> anyway, okay, y'all, we're gonna pack a whole lot into this and we are going, you're going to see the consummate definition of permaculture today. And we've always decided from way back that the best way to go about that is not necessarily giving you a nebulous definition for permaculture. We've done it before by giving you the ethics, the prime directive, and it's best by showing you, and that's exactly what we're gonna do today. And we're gonna combine so many techniques. Don't worry y'all, we're not gonna get you confused because we're gonna constantly refer you back to other videos that are helpers into the video that we're gonna do today. Okay, so here we are in the middle of the food forest or the emerging food forest. Behind us, behind us, you see a hugel culture mound. Behind it is a love pond. So here we are up the hill, just to kind of give you a brief understanding, alongside the driveway out of this area is basically an orchard up top. Then it makes a transition into what's going to be a food forest. There is a difference. Then as we approach down to the bottom, we get the hugel mound, we get the pond, and then we got a lot more things. So the idea is that in the future, because this place is in fact a demonstration site, that in the future people can come here, say, oh, that's what a food forest looks like. Oh, that's what a permaculture orchard looks like. That's how you integrate a centropic thing into all this. That's the way your water works. That's exactly what we're building here. And today, this is what we're off and running with. So honey, what do we got over here? This is a plum cot. All right, y'all. So just a little back. A uh, little backstory. Anybody that's watched our videos is probably saying, man, it ain't fall. Why are you planting trees? Well, beggars can't be choosers because honestly, in the fall, it was easier to find Bin Laden than it was to find bare root trees. But here it is. We got a local place. You guys picked them up yesterday, right? And they were considerably cheaper than anything else you could find. And what's the advantages of picking stuff that's local, honey? Well, they're more adapted to your, your climate and they're going to do well in your climate. Some of the species that you get from other places might not do well, so you're taking a chance, but if you can find a local source, then you're increasing your chance for survival for the trees. Right, and also when you do a bare root, the cool thing about that is, is that it can more easily adapt to your soil type than if you had one that's in a pot. Now there's debate on all this. If you want more references on that, like I said, we've done numerous examples, numerous videos on how to plant a tree, Today's gonna to be a different because we're gonna show you how we adapt all this stuff in the permaculture way. So, first up, you wanna find a location, okay? And you wanna know the proclivities of your tree. You wanna know, is it gonna do well in shade, partial shade, full sun? That's important. So, we know all those things, and right here, bam, right there is a the spot we're gonna take. Now, before this area, was the site of where this tree is gonna go. What was it before now? What did we do last year with this spot? We just um, put down a bunch of cardboard, put down a bunch of mulch because it was just grass here before that. Right, so we did an instant garden. Go back and watch that video. We did an instant garden for a couple of reasons. Number one, to get a crop, it's centropically, and go back and check that stuff out. Number two, was also to kind of get the worms working on this area because this soil was jacked up from the feet up. Throughout this video, y'all, I'm gonna be showing you all kinds of cool tricks and tips along the way. Now, this one I learned from the permaculture orchard guy, Stefan Subkoviak. In fact, there's a whole lot of what we do that is inspired by that good man. Go check out his channel, check out the permaculture orchard, check out all of his information. It is invaluable. Don't neglect your education. Now, I wanna apologize ahead of time to all the worms that might likely be sacrificed in this process. <laughs> So, one thing I picked up from Mr. Subkoviak, and I can't believe I never thought of it before, take your cardboard that you're gonna use in a little while to put your dirt on. There's a couple of reasons for that. Now, we got mulch around us, but if you had grass, you're gonna lose a lot of it right there in the grass. So use your cardboard. Don't worry, it's gonna all make sense here in a little while. 
Mm, a little bit more. I'm gonna take some out right here. And y'all check this out. Look at this soil down here. This is why we let it, we, we basically amended this soil with the worms. This was not the kind of soil that used to be here, y'all. The worms did all this. It was straight up, I mean, down here, it was mostly sand and clay, and it was the red type. The worms did such a good job in exchanging that soil, and that's exactly what we want to see. So I'm going to put that in here. What are we looking like, honey? Let me go ahead and take out a little bit more. Okay. Mm, okay. That's exactly what I want to see, y'all. Now, before we put this in here, take a good look. Take a real good look. This is your graft union. This is rootstock. This is the scion. This is the tree you're going to grow, which is, in fact, what you're seeing here, okay? So you want to know where your dominant wind is because you want your graft union on the opposite side. You, because if the wind, for, for us, the dominant wind is coming from this direction, okay? And I want this tree pushing back at it. You dig? Plus, another reason I love these bare roots so much is I'm not going to have to stake them. I'm not going to have to do any of that stuff. So I got it in here, and now we're just going to go ahead and backfill. I'll hold it steady. Michelle's gonna backfill. Okay, make sure this graft union is above the surface. I try to get it as high as I possibly can because if you wind up burying this, it's gonna be shooting off all kinds of energy, shooting out stuff out of the rootstock. That's not where you want it. You want it coming out of this end, not your root stock. Um, so make sure that that is well above the surface, as high as you could possibly get it, okay? That part is done. Next thing is, if, and it, it's all a matter of what you want to do. If you have compost or whatever, you want to put it down now, then the cardboard, then the mulch. Any amendments, you want to be absolutely sure. Don't stick them in the hole. You want to stick them on top. And in fact, that's another little trick I got from Mr. Subkoviak where he said, go back and check out the work of Carl Whitcomb from Oklahoma State University, who's done enormous work on this type of stuff. And uh, you find out that the capillarity, all these things work better if you let your worms, think about how nature does it. Remember, it's permaculture. Think about how nature does it. Nature always puts the fertility on top. So we got a cardboard here. Now I'm gonna show you a little trick I invented. I, show, I think I showed my Patreon people. Here's what I came up with a long time ago. Cut it almost to the center, cut a Y in it, just like so. And then I'm gonna show you the coolest way to do this. Take that little Y, push it back like so. And I'm just gonna fold up one piece of the cardboard like that. And then depending on which way, this is kind of important, this part here. Find out which way the water's gonna run off this thing. And for us, it comes down this way because, and so which means I'm gonna stick it on just like that. Bam! How cool is that? The reason why I wanna make sure I, I know which way the water's gonna come is because if you have it with the opening on this side, when it rains, it's just gonna take everything with it. This way, if it does rain and it pushes, it's gonna push into the tree. Typically, that's not a problem. Remember when I said a minute ago that we're gonna do everything the permaculture way? Well, about 20 steps that way is the chicken tractor on steroids. Let's go over there and get some. <laughs> This here is basically a combination of mulch and compost. Now, if I were to sift this stuff out, it's pretty bomb compost. It's pretty darn close. We've talked extensively about the chicken tractor on steroids. Go back and check that out, folks. Can't think of a more consequential way of raising your food and getting your compost in these times. I made sure that we use stuff that was a little woodier because it's gonna be more fungal dominant. And that's exactly what we want down there around these trees. Okay, so all we're gonna do at this point, honey, I'll do this side if you wanna do that one. We're gonna put out a mulch ring and I'm gonna show you what not to do. If you drive all over Asheville, this is what you're gonna see. I kid you not. Even though it's the worst thing in the world you can do in terms of adding mulch to a tree, right? Yep. So we're introducing all kinds of chances for disease. We're also covering up our graft union, which is awful. Okay, so let's show them how we're going to do this, honey. We put our mulch ring out. 
see this? It's basically, we're gonna actually leave a little down here at the bottom. So what you want basically is something that looks like a donut. So here we are, we got everything covered up to that point. All right, so we showed you step one and two. Now we got a tree in the ground, but remember we don't do anything in isolation. This is permaculture. Things work like the fingers of your hand. Your thumb does pretty good well by itself, but it sure does a really great job with the other fingers, right? So this guy or gal needs help. That's what we're doing next. That'll be step three. Okay, we're gonna put in the guild or basically the support species around this. It's not all of them, but we're starting off with what we can do right now. Now, here's a little trick I showed to the people on Patreon a while back. Ain't that right? Definitely. Guess he wanted to be part of this. Okay, so we're gonna have rings of things around here. And it all depends on how you want to do it. A really good example of that, if you want to look into it, go check out the book Guy's Garden. It does a really good job of explaining a method of doing it. It's not necessarily the one we do, but it is. If you're just starting off, it's a good way to get off and running. But here's a little trick that I made simple. You already got a shovel with you, so use it as your measuring device. So let's say eight inches from here, I'm going to put hmm, garlic. Let's say I want to put... Um, Daffodils. Daffodils. So I'm going to go by at the edge of my shovel. And you can make these marks permanent if you like. So eight inches. Okay. I know that a certain distance out, I'm going to want to put comfrey. So in my case, let's say I pick three feet. It could be four. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to put a measurement on there. A three foot mark, which is right here where this handle begins. So if you need it, I mean, you don't have to have, you could have other tick marks in here for things you want to have. So in our case, so I'm just gonna stick this up against the tree. See my little mark there? If you need a measuring stick so you don't have to carry around a tape measure, bam, it's already there. So I put one here. I'm gonna flip it over this way, put one here, so on and so forth, you get the point. And then when I'm ready to do the uh, comfrey, bam, I know it's gonna be right here. See what I'm saying? Make life easier for yourself and give your tools multiple uses because instead of carrying that and this, I just can carry that. We're just gonna demonstrate it right here. We don't really need it, but at this point, bam. We're gonna say our daffodils are gonna go right there. Even though y'all, this is a little long in the tooth, should have done this before. She's gonna get down there. Now, hang on, before she covers that up, show you another little trick. So this is where it's gonna go. A lot of times we just kind of place them and then the person will come by, make a little hole. And then all I'm gonna do is take my knife, cut a hole in there. You can even cut an X if you like. And then we'll take this daffodil bulb, we'll put your finger through it, take the daffodil bulb, stick it down in there, and then cover it up. So we'll do it again, use our marker. How many daffodils do you want in here? You, I just have four, but you could do really as many as you want because daffodils help repel deer, so it's part of your deer resistant package. We, we have four, but I mean, you really could do a whole ring around them if you want to. Like I said, this ain't the best time to be putting in daffodils, but hey, we got them. So we're gonna put them in anyway and see how it goes. And they're already kind of coming to life. Now, going right back to the shovel, make it easy for yourself. So around every tree, we always put at least two comfrey. Sometimes we put four. And like I said, folks, if you need it, we got it at the website. So we'll use our, get. once again, we'll go ahead. I know, that over on these other trees around it, that the comfrey is at least in two places, sometimes four. Look, we got it, so we're gonna put it in four places because we can't grow enough comfrey. We use it for our animals. We use it in our compost. You can make comfrey tea. Comfrey, and I should never say this as a permaculture designer, but I would say if I had to pick one plant that is the most useful, can you think of anything other than comfrey? Mm -mm. No, no, we use it more than anything. And folks, the uses are endless. And we're finding out that we really don't know the full extent of it. All right, y'all, I got some of this comfrey root. And like I said, we sell it. So I'm going to go to the edge of here. I'm just going to move it back. Look, here's how easy it is to plant this stuff. I've come into a little bit of cardboard. I'm just going to put my shovel in and just kind of weave it back and forth like so. It's really this simple. I'm going to stick it in there. About two inches down, cover it over. That's a wrap. Okay, we got this one in. Once again, use the shovel. Plus it gives you, a, it's kind of a cool straight edge. I'm gonna stick it in and it's really this simple. I mean, this stuff is very forgiving. So we're gonna stick it in. How do we put it in, honey? How do we plant it? Uh, you're gonna lay it horizontally. Bam. This here is all sand, y'all. This is the area where we didn't have that stuff. So I'm just gonna cover it up. That's a wrap. We're gonna hit it over there and over there. 
this uh, tag eventually is going to be taken off of there. And what we use are these um, these little tags that go just right next to it. I think you write it on with a special pencil. I think it's like a zinc tag. But anyway, we just it it's permanent and it goes right here on this side of the tree. Okay, remember y'all, your guilds could and should be a lot bigger. Add everything in here that's going to benefit your tree, okay? And your tree in turn benefits them as well. Also, your mulch ring, it could be, I mean, it should be, when we're all said and done, it'll sit maybe a foot high at the highest point of it, okay? And it'll go plumb out to here. So it could be every bit of two feet, three feet. We've gone as, as honestly, in diameter, as wide as eight feet in some of the trees we've done in the past, like those peaches we did back in Texas that were blowing up. So next step, next step is step four, going right back to the protection. What good is it having a tree here if we can't protect it. If the deer, like they used to before we did this, are gonna come back and dog us, well, it doesn't mean anything. So this is why we got around to making bone sauce because no matter what we did, whether it was hanging bars of soap, using the store-bought stuff for deer repellent, nothing worked. It, okay, I'll take that back. It worked for maybe two weeks at the most. Check it out. You put this on here and um, you're good for up to 30 to 50 years, depending on whom you ask. Now, I haven't done it that long, clearly, but um, this is an old Austrian recipe, a way it was done. Um, it was made known to the world by a guy named Sepp Holzer. Genius, up in the Alps. Well, we've taken, look, this stuff ain't easy to make, and we've come up with a proprietary process to make this stuff even stronger than anybody else. Now, essentially, it's bones, a tiny bit of water, heat, and a process that we invented. So all you gotta do, you're gonna find out just how long this stuff or how far you can stretch this stuff. As soon as it's in there, I'm just gonna take this paintbrush and if you can get it a little bit warm, that helps. And really, this is all we're gonna do. You wanna make sure that if you have any green on there, you don't wanna hit that, okay? You wanna make sure you stay away from the green. And it really doesn't take much at all. We're gonna go as low as we can because down low, it's gonna repel the rabbits up high, clearly it's gonna repel the deer. We found out that every third tree is usually enough to repel your deer issue. So this is an eight ounce jar, and look at how far, just one little dip in the uh, bone sauce was enough to do this entire tree. Now, typically you can go all the way around. I like to prefer, I like to just do one side of it. So the other side can absolutely breathe. That's something else we've added. If you want a more comprehensive uh, list of uses of what we do with the bone sauce, Go back and watch this video right there. We get more questions about bone sauce than anything else. The deer repellent that you get at like tractor supply and places like that, you have to keep reapplying after it rains. This stuff, you don't have to reapply after it rains. It will stay, it will stay on there. Especially only if it's on a wooden surface. Now, if it's on a metal surface, we don't really know. But Michelle is basically going all the way around. You hit all the metal posts and all the wooden posts. We had a deer issue. Well, you know what? We're gonna talk about it in the permaculture way. We didn't have a deer problem. We had a lack of bone sauce problem. Look, I'm not trying to pimp this stuff out and sell it, y'all. I know that it works better than anything you can buy out there, and that's why we sell it. That's why we make it. And also why we're probably gonna be coming up short here before too long, because believe it or not, bones are getting tough to find. So if we have shortages at the website, you'll know the reasons why, because I'm not gonna rush any process. So in addition to putting on the bone sauce, step four, we're gonna basically say it's your more physical protection. You can use some of this hardware cloth. I like this half inch stuff. Now you could put it around there if you wanted to. Um, we've done it in the past. In fact, you can see some of the other trees that still have it on there. But um, I, at this point, I don't really think it's necessary. We don't have any rabbit pressure with the bone sauce. So I'm just gonna omit this, but if you want it, this is what you want to put on there. So get some, cut it to what you ever cut it to whatever length you need, stick it around there. Or if you have dogs that are known to want to chew on the surfaces of things, I don't know that the in fact I'm sure the bone sauce doesn't work on dogs, but if anything else, and she finds that just absolutely hilarious. So that's where you want to go back to this. Okay, so that's your number one, that's number per little that's your last line of defense. Okay, now we're gonna get into step five. So step five is going to be watering your tree. Um, we just grabbed some water from the from the heart-shaped pond down here. It's and a love pond. Baby. No, it's the heart. It's 
Charlotte called it a heart pond. She said the love pond. She did. No, she didn't. Okay. I don't care what it is. Yeah, she said it looks like a heart, but I call it the love pond because I love little Charlotte and I love you. All right, what's next? All right, y'all, when you're doing this, try to stay away from that fluoridated water or that chlorinated water, any of that kind of stuff like that. It ain't going to do you no favors. Now, we like getting pond water sometimes because guess what? You've got life in there. There's a lot of microbes in it. So that is it. Now, remember, let me just jump back a step. One of the big reasons we like to make sure we absolutely positively get our compost from right here, we want to make it, is because of the microbes that are indigenous to your property are going to already be in it. So when you buy compost or whatever from a thousand miles away, it's like taking an Eskimo and dropping them off in the equator or taking a Panamanian and dropping them off up in Alaska. So here we are. We covered all that. Five steps. But folks, I'd be remiss if I didn't put out the most important step. And you already know if you've watched this channel, that is praying over everything. And that's exactly, I'm not going to make, I'm not going to do some gratuitous vulgarity where I do it on camera. Um, but just know that now that this tree is in, now that everything is around it, I'm, I'm, we're going to ask the good Lord to bless it. And to us, that's one of the most important things we can possibly do. So remember, look at all the links we've provided through this video. If you need anything of consequence, in these days, I know people are freaking out a little bit, but hey, we need a video like this to really kind of center things because at the end of the day, folks, a lot of us in the, in the homestead world forget about the value of trees. We forget about perennial crops. We forget about those things that once you get them off and running, they still produce a yield. For some reason, a lot of us in the, per, in the homestead world forget about that. So remember it. This could be one of your most important allies. So don't forget it. And think about doing it the permaculture way because it's honestly the easier way and the best way in our view. So remember, if you need anything at the website, whether it's bone sauce or some of the comfort you've seen us use, check us out there. If you need um, things that we have in the description box below, whether it be a consultation, hit us up at permapasturesfarm at gmail.com. Need an EMP shield, we got it down there. Check us out on Patreon. We put a lot of great information out over there as well. So, folks, that's going to do it for us. So, on behalf of the Homestead Honey, this is Billy from <laughs> Permapastures Farm, where permaculture is my passion. Isn't that right, honey?